Well, Rick, uh, we're going to get a chance to talk about uh, the rationale behind owning metals and miners at a moment in time where they're actually popular, which has uh, not been the case for, for a fair, fair bit of time. And um, perhaps we can get into um, um, you know, how they're set up and positioned, which I think is quite unique right now. But for those who don't know um, your, your background, maybe you could give us just a little quick um, blurb as to what made you decide to pursue following miners, at least for the last 20 or 25 years. I'm not sure exactly what you're doing before that. Maybe you could tell folks, and then I'll admit what made me get into it. I actually uh, came into the business in very early adulthood in the 1970s. Uh, I had an odd sense because I enjoyed the out of doors that I should focus on natural resources. The consequence of which is I haven't been out of doors. I've been tied to an office for 45 years. Uh, I came of age as a businessman in the 1970s and most of my young colleagues in finance were in broad based equities, which is to say from the period 1970 to 1983, uh, they got a little poorer every day for 13 years. But by contrast, I was in the resource business. Uh, and you'll remember the decade of the 70s, Bill, not that some of our listeners will, but the decade of the 70s was really a halcyon time for natural resources, which was both good and bad for me. I enjoyed a lot of success and a lot of credibility early in my career. Uh, unfortunately, I came to confuse a bull market with brains. Uh, I thought the fact that the gold price went from thirty five dollars to eight hundred and fifty and the oil price went from three dollars to thirty. Uh, I, somehow I conflated the success that I enjoyed as a consequence of having the wind in my sails with being smart. Uh, <laughs> 1982, the price collapse taught me just exactly how smart I was. Uh, and I went from being a hubris ridden, very wealthy young man to having a net worth that was below zero. Uh, with a much better sense of how smart I was relative to markets. But the great news about that, Bill, is that that experience taught me in, in a way that's literally unforgettable, mm -hmm. that in businesses that are capital intensive and cyclical like resources, you are either a contrarian or you are going to be a victim. Uh, it taught me, too, how to weather bear markets like the one that you and I have just been through for the last decade. Because truly, low prices are the cure for low prices, and high prices are the cure for high prices. Uh, I've learned, too, and I think we'll talk in this discussion uh, about the thing that while the macro uh, shapes your opinion as to what to do, it's securities analysis that makes you money. Uh, one of the things that's amused me about the gold mining business over 40 years has been the fact that the gold adherents uh, are always so critical uh, of governments counterfeiting uh, when in fact the broker dealers and the dealer <laughs> network can print more counterfeit share certificates than the government can ever fit uh, print counterfeit species. So I'm hoping at the end of this discussion that we, discu that we discuss both types of counterfeiting, uh, that is central bank counterfeiting and dealer network counterfeiting. But I look forward to having this discussion with you. So uh, leading with my chin, I was uh, not really in business for real um, uh, in the early 70s. I, I started out my career at, uh, writing software for the Burroughs Corporation, big machines that kind of took up rooms, had air conditioning and the elevated floors, all that. But I began to get interested in finance in the late 70s. And um, of course, things were not great in America. But I remember sitting down with my dad thinking, I think it might be a good time to go into finance because I think things are starting to change. I think I was pretty lucky to understand that then because I didn't really know much, but it turned out that was the right idea. So for me, when I got started in, in 1980, it was the, the bull market was almost over. I remember January of 80 very well when gold really went nuts. And upon you know all the time I spent reviewing history now, one of the mind-blowing things to me was from like October of 79 to early – um, uh, January of 80, the price of gold doubled after Paul Volcker told you exactly what he was going to do and took actions to back it up and nobody believed him. And I think I like to bring that vignette up because today central bankers are revered. I mean, the, people think they walk on water and they can't make mistakes. We mo both know that's not true and it'll come to pass. We'll discuss and I, that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm in what I'm in. 
But um, back then, Volcker was doing exactly the right thing. They didn't believe him. So that's the power of that's the power of psychology, in my opinion. And once it gets going in one direction, it's hard to shift it. In any case, so I spent, I left the brokerage business and be, uh, joined a money, uh, became a partner in a small money management firm in 1982. And I really wasn't involved in the the resource sector much, but for we were very, we were contrarians and value investors. So when oil or something would get cheap, we'd get we'd get involved. And in '86, all commodities got cheap, and so I started looking at in addition to oil and drillers, and I started studying the mining industry a little bit. But I didn't really, and I and I got kind of infatuated with silver in the early '90s because it was so cheap. You know, it, I was, but it stayed cheap for a decade, um, and so I, I learned about that. Um, but my, the, what ultimately has was led to me becoming more involved in metals and mining now than most anything else was because I was convinced that the Federal Reserve was going down a bad path. And I thought Greenspan was a very poor um, uh, steward at the Fed, and he only went from bad to worse to worser to worser. And in 1996, I decided that, uh, 95, 96, I decided that um, it was all going to end in big trouble. So I left the firm I was with. They merged with another group of guys, and I went out to start a shirt fund. It did pretty well um, until uh, the fall of 98, when Greenspan uh, made the amazingly irresponsible cut to bail out long-term capital after the market returned. In any case, um, uh, um, and so I had done quite well on the short side, and then I had an 18-month period where I, I just got buried and you know, um, was, was you know, uh, really, really got punished. And what that taught me was that, given the, the out of controlness of the Fed, that I needed to find ways uh, to um, vote against them, but um, stay out of trouble. So I changed my methodology, my short fund, and it worked very well. But then when they started QE in 08, I, I threw in the towel. I said, it's going to be impossible to be short. Now, I didn't know I was going to turn out to be as right with hindsight as I was. I didn't know we, what the next you know, 10, 12 years were going to hold. But I came, but but there was a couple of times I thought about restarting my short fund. And the reason I have a short fund is because you find companies that have problems. But the macro environment was such that the Fed has promoted unintended consequences of, you know, now we have massive debts. We keep cacking the can down the road. There's wealth inequality, blah, blah, blah. But with what I've come to conclude is with metals and miners, you can make, you can bet with the central bank's policies, but own calls on the unintended consequences of their policies. So for that reason now, these days, I'm pretty much kind of all in on metals and mining, although I look at other things and you know maybe you might get short from time to time. But so here we find ourselves and lo and behold, we find out last weekend that one of either Warren Buffett or one of his lieutenants has realized that, hey, there's real value in the gold stocks. And um, it seems to me, and I'd really like your view on this, well, along the way, I was became a director of Pan American Resources. I learned a lot from Ross Beatty and the boys from 95 till I, re- I got off the board in 2012 and I was the lead director. So I learned a, a fair bit about the industry, although I wouldn't consider myself super knowledgeable. In, in any case, because of the last five or six years and, and how the miners sort of misplayed their hand and got a bit dealt a bad one from a cost standpoint, it seems like now they've gotten religion, and a lot of these companies are set up to really make a lot of money, gush cash flow, and pay dividends. And if you run some of today's prices through spreadsheets, you can see what it might look like in the next couple of years. Obviously, the guys in Buffett shop did the same thing with Barrick. Now, we don't know if that's one off or more, but so that's my case for being in this sector now is you get to be bet with the central banks, but you get you know, embedded calls on all their, on the unintended consequences of their bad policies. You said a lot of interesting things there. Uh, and first of all, I concur, I'm afraid, with virtually all of them. I wish I could poke some holes in something you said, but that's, a, that's above my pay grade. Uh, one of the things that you said is of particular interest to me, which is to say that the Fed policy is uniquely good for precious metals miners right now. Their cost of capital, because it's a capital intensive business, is um, very low. The general equities market is propelled higher by artificially low interest rates, and the cost of debt is propelled lower by artificially low interest rates. At the same time that the outcome of the Fed policy 
means that the wind is in the sails of precious metals. So the Fed simultaneously lowers the cost of capital for a capital intensive industry <laughs> at the same time that it boosts the product price. Uh, and as you say, we need all the help that we can get. Uh, the second thing that you said I think is important was your sort of genesis in the mining business, which is to say that you had the good sense and maybe the good luck uh, to uh, become, as a consequence of being attracted to silver, uh, in the orbit of a serially successful human being named Ross Beatty. Yes. Uh, first of all, participating in the stock and enjoying that incredible run-up uh, is good for your net worth and your reputation, but probably more important, uh, hanging around with a guy and a management team that's been successful in 13 out of 14 starts yeah. uh, is a really wonderful way to gently avoid uh, some of the pitfalls <laughs> in the business. And I, I, I want to make sure that our listeners hear that. Yes, that's a really good point. And 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 it was the good news, bad news also. So I'll again lead with my chin. Um, I got spoiled because the management at Pan American, uh, in my opinion, was so top notch, and all the people that I really liked and uh, respected, you know, to to this day, they're almost all still there, which speaks volumes about the culture of the place and 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 how the kind of people they get and how they treat them. But when I was rooting around for miners in the you know in the post 08 period. Um, I made some mistakes in my picks because I was spoiled by the quality of the guys that I'd been working with. And I was so spoiled that, I mean, the things ran so well. I mean, I read all the briefing books and all this stuff. I was very attentive as a director, but I just didn't have a good enough appreciation for the kinds of dumb things you can do and the things that can sneak up on you. So, so I, I, I saw the good, I saw the bad. Now I understand the good. So, I mean, I, to this day, I follow Ross around. I see what he's doing, and I'm in most of the things that he's in simply because he's got a good nose. He puts good people around him. And, of course, in the industry we're talking about, if they're small stocks and you have a, 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 a man behind the company like Ross who not only has the brains and the contacts but the capital himself, it makes the whole financing dynamic. I think one thing that people probably don't appreciate as much as you and I might is that in the mining industry, the stock price is a fundamental because oftentimes you need to raise capital, raise capital, and the more the stock price approaches some level that makes sense, the less dilutive it's all going to be. But we'll get back to that part later about how the broker dealers help screw that up. <laughs> In terms of the macro case, I I'd like to know how you feel about this because I sort of feel like you know gold and silver have their own personalities. Silver being quite more volatile than gold. And I think it's possible to have some sort of sense that policies are at work and that are liable to push the prices up higher. But I myself never have any idea where the price could ultimately go. And I see people put price tags of pick a number. You know, you can make up whatever number you want and people do. Do you spend much time thinking about where the price is ultimately going to go or are you just happy to be on the right side of the way it's going? You know, I look for a circumstance uh, I've learned at age 67 that life doesn't have many certainties, but it has lots of probabilities. And so I try and align myself with probabilities. Uh, one of the things that I see now is a set of circumstances, a set of policy responses that seems to me to be extremely supportive of precious metals prices. Quantitative easing, which if you and I did it would be called counterfeiting. Uh, by its nature, debases the currency and debases the purchasing power of fiat currency denominated savings over time. Uh, artificially low interest rates, too, discourage saving and increase spending and reduce your ability through a coupon to protect the purchasing power of your saving. Uh, I, I note that from my own personal point of view, gold is uh, probably the anti-treasury. And U.S. treasuries were in a 35-year bull market. If my memory serves me well, the 10-year treasury in terms of yield peaked over 15. Uh, it's now at 50 basis points, an epic bull market. Could it go lower? Yes. But is it closer to the bottom than the top? Yes. So if uh, treasuries being the anti-gold are 
are closer to the top than the bottom, it makes sense that the anti-treasury gold is closer to the bottom than the top. The third thing that let me think that time was on my side in a macro sense is that precious metals and precious metals related assets have the smallest market share of savings and investment products that they have ever had. It is estimated that at present, between one third and one half of 1% of savings and investment assets in the United States are in precious metals or precious metals related investments. It is estimated too that the three decade mean is between one and a half and 2%. So even if you throw out you know, that old gold bug yeah. thesis about the collapse of the dollar and the gold standard right. and all that happy idiocy. Uh, the truth is, if all we do is revert to mean, demand for precious metals related investments goes from one half of 1% to one and a half to 2%. In other words, it triples or quadruples. And I think given quantitative easing, artificially low interest rates and debt and deficits, that that's a very likely outcome. A price target, uh, to me, that's witchcraft. Yeah. Uh, just higher. Yeah. So that's, that's all I can say, just higher. So we're on the same page as, as far as that goes. For viewers who may not know this, that don't have quite the level of gray hair that we do, in the last 30 or 40 years, there, as you point out, the, the, the exposure of, of most portfolios to precious metals and related uh, equities is quite small, as you noted, it's a rounding error. Um, when I, even in the early 80s, people still talked about, you know, having an allocation of 5% or even 10% to precious metals. I think that was pretty common in the, <clears throat> in the 60s and 70s, or sorry, in the 70s in particular, you would know better than I. So when you say, well, if it went from a half percent to two or 3%, that's really not even a big number relative to, I know 70s sounds like ancient history to people, but the policies we're pursuing are more akin to what got us into the 70s than they are to what gave us the, the very good 80s and, and, and part of the 90s. So you're, that, that, that little number you're talking about isn't very big from a historical perspective in the right environment. No, true. If I wanted to throw kerosene on the fire, I could use a different number. Right. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting. What, what I am suggesting, I think, probably that we went into the 70s in better political and fiscal condition yes. than we're coming into this decade. So the responses that we can employ to get out of the fix that we've got ourselves in are constrained compared to then. But I don't need, uh, in order to justify my thesis, uh, to talk about uh, the market share increasing to 5% or 10%. If you right. take the, mar if you take the uh, market share of precious metals related assets to one and a half or 2%, you triple demand for a class of assets uh, that is already under accumulation. And you do it in an economy that, while challenged, is still 22% of aggregate savings and investments in the world. Uh, it, it, it's a truly uh, nutty prospect. Well, yeah, I was only trying to put, point out that your number was actually really low. And so right. there was, the, you know, so um, I was trying to give some perspective that that is not not even close to being outlandish. It's very low. So if people are watching this because they're either in, they sort of believe some of the same things that we do, um, but they're kind of scratching their head about how to value miners, um, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the things we each look for in terms of, um, you know, and, and how the mining sector stratifies between explorer co companies and small producers and bigger producers and larger producers. And of course, evaluation is all different and how jurisdictions matter. I think that um, that is uh, might be something that, that people would care about um, and it might find useful. And um, I would also like to throw this question at you. This is a long, long question. One of my pet peeves is when people look at well, you know what, let's save that. I was wanted to talk about valuation, but maybe we could talk about the things, you must have some kind of a checklist of the things that you wanna see for the kinds of companies you can invest in. Maybe you'll share yours and I'll share mine and then we can talk about valuation a little later. Yeah, I have to segregate between what I do for Sprott, uh, which manages money for 200,000 people, and what I do for myself, uh, which are okay. very different circumstances. There's no one size fits all strategy. 
in a bear market, that is when you are preparing for a bull market, uh, I think it's instructive. Uh, I think it's instructive to capture beta in a market that's recovering. And I try to buy the very, very best of the best, the very highest quality companies. I refer frequently, and I'll draw viewers' attentions to the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which is the broadest based and longest running gold equities index. And what that teaches us is that not bull markets, but rather recoveries from oversold bottoms deliver index returns that vary from 150% for the index, not the best stock in the index, up to 1,200%. So the bear market strategy is to de-risk the beta. Don't try to outperform the market. Uh, in fact, be content to underperform the market a little bit by taking out any kind of single company risk. So you buy the very, very, very best businesses, which is precisely, I think, what Buffett was trying to do with Barrick. Buffett doesn't even like Barrick's product. Uh, he, he calls gold a pet rock. What he liked about Barrick was uh, a series of top quality assets, but more importantly, an enterprise value, which is to say market cap uh, you know, plus cash minus debt that was very cheap relative to the free cash flow that he expected to be delivered uh, from uh, proven reserves over time, probably adding back the optionality associated with resources that wouldn't have been economic at 1200 that might be highly economic at 2000. Uh, so I think early in the market, you look for the best and most liquid names. Traditionally in these markets, um, the best of the best uh, begin to sell at such premium valuations that sophisticated value-oriented investors come down the quality trail looking for yeah. relative value. And if yeah. they don't, they get taken over by the large multi-asset producers that have a lower cost of capital in a capital-intensive business. You know, I, I really think that the answer as to how you develop a portfolio and how you select stocks depends, first of all, on who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. But it also depends on where you are uh, in the cycle. At the beginning of the cycle, you need to be in the best of the best. And when the cycle's long of tooth and you think it has some room to run, you need to retreat back to the best of best because the valuation discrepancies begin to disappear. And you need the liquidity to exit when you have overstayed your welcome. Uh, which I certainly will. <laughs> I think um, one of the things that you noted before we went on the air was the slavish tendency of investors to look for very simple to understand rules of thumb uh, and, and the laziness of analysts associated solely with net present value, uh, not looking at optionality and not looking importantly at recycle ratio. Uh, recycle ratio is something that comes more from the oil and gas business, where you try and anticipate the returns on capital employed on the reinvestment of free cash flow from existing operations. Uh, what you have found with Ross Beatty, as an example, is an absolutely superior deployer of capital. <laughs> uh, a guy who, yes, has made some mistakes, but if you juxtapose his uh, mistakes against his successes, right. what you find is a guy who you can trust over the course of a decade, uh, not just to do good things with the money that he is able to raise, but also uh, do good things by deploying the free cash from existing operations uh, effectively. Buffett said he's looking for a business that generates 15% internal rates of return. Uh, that can be deployed back into the basic business and continue to enjoy 15% compound internal rates of return. And I think that's the magic in the mining business, uh, finding people who have the ability to use their reputation and expertise to take advantage of these times and grow their businesses cheaply. So what we both acknowledged is as well as you can determine it, the, the quality of the management is a single... Right one of the single biggest variables a person can have on their checklist. The second most important thing for me is jurisdiction. Uh, and everybody is more comfortable with different kinds of right. jurisdictional risk than others. Um, I, 
I, I decided that I'm going to keep it as plain vanilla as possible uh, and try to stay with the very best countries. But as we have seen recently, even in Nevada, I mean, America is supposed to be one of the best places where they're talking about putting this, you know, very onerous tax on revenues. And we'll see what happens. The country risk is 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 a, a seriously important thing. And to the extent that gold does well and, um, you know, uh, um, government budgets are strapped, we may see a push for higher taxes in a lot of places. But we don't really there's a, there's a lot of places where at least we don't have to worry about expropriation risk and those kinds of things. So I would assume that you are fairly strict about the places you'll be willing to uh, own mines in. Is that a fair guess? No, this response will surprise you. I believe that all countries are bad. Um, the <laughs> worst experience with political risk that I ever had in terms of money lost was in the People's Republic of California. Uh, we made a discovery in California in 1980, unfortunately seven miles on the wrong side of the California-Nevada line. Uh, and it took us, if my memory serves me correctly, 13 years to put that deposit into production. At the time, we should have been able to put it in production. The price of gold was $700. At the time we were able to put it in production, it was at $300. It took us uh, $16 million in bribes, not efficient bribes, the kind that might work in emerging markets, but rather campaign contributions, deeds in lieu. And of course, 13 years on a time value of money, uh, from a time value of money point of view, the money that we were able to generate in 1993 had no net present value in 1980 terms. So I've come to the conclusion in age 67, having done business in countries around the world, that money stolen from me in English by white people, according to the rule of law, is just as gone as money that's stolen from me by more efficient uh, third world uh, people. In fact, the best country in the world, from my personal experience, in terms of cash in, cash out, and the rule of law, has been Chile. Uh, I was part of a group that sued the Chilean government in Chilean courts, and the Chilean government settled with us, knowing that the courts would follow the rule of law. I wouldn't want to try that in California, frankly. Right. Uh, I have also personally been treated reasonably well in Russia, which isn't to say that I haven't had. Well, we <laughs> had, had, a, had a really bad experience there. But anyway, yeah, I, I remember the experience you had and Bob Quartermain had it, too. Uh, right, and exactly. We we got we had some challenges in Russia, along with the Lundines, um, which we were able to handle mercifully in Russian fashion. Let's leave it at that. Yeah, I have had very, very, very good uh financial results in Congo. My suspicion is that political cycles are very much like resource cycles, which is to say that countries that can't afford to treat you poorly for a while treat you well. Right. And when they can afford to rape you, well, which <laughs> the states can do right now, they certainly return to that. I I'll tell you, and I'm not making a joke, I would certainly rather discover a mine in Katanga, in southern Congo, than I would in California. And I'm not saying that to get a headline. Uh, no, I know. I'm just trying to say that Katanga has no second choice. Uh, <laughs> and California at least perceives that they have lots of second choices. So I go more to deposit uh, and to where a country is in the cycle. Our mutual friend, Ross Beatty, who makes a, a lot of reference to safe jurisdiction, has most of the growth in front of him. Uh, right. If he's able to successfully negotiate sociology and politics in Argentina and Guatemala, two countries that are perceived as being pariahs. I think what Ross understands is that if you invest the time to understand the social circumstance and the politics, that the best opportunities are in countries that are recovering. And, and that's sort of the way that I would believe. Well, I think you make good points. I, 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 I probably should have said it slightly differently in that in an overall portfolio, I want to I want to try to have it kind of mixed up. But but the point I think you're making is, quote unquote, safe ju jurisdictions uh, can be overrated. And, and I think you made an excellent nuanced point about you need to know where each one of these locales sort of sort of is in their own cycle. But um, uh, and I think that's a really good uh, distinction. Yeah. And, you know, Bill, you and I uh, have enough experience of successes and failures that we're both psychologically fairly durable. 
there are a lot of investors and a lot of speculators who are not that durable. Uh, people for whom the prospect of risk is so daunting that they'll get shaken out of a position before the position has a chance to mature. The willingness to invest in jurisdictions that will deliver you supply surprises, some of which are unpleasant, uh, and, and having the psychological durability to get through those yeah. things means that you know there's different different horses for different courses. I'm probably unusually inured to risk having experienced so much of it in my career. Well, I, and, and having said that I like jurisdiction, I've taken a little page out of your book in that I currently have some small positions, smaller companies in, you know, Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala. Well, the Guatemala is through Pan America. We'll see what right. happens. That, that's one thing Ross has always said, you know, that, well, it's just because it's been bad doesn't mean it's gonna be bad and then things can get better. So um, I'd like to get to one of my uh, pet peeves in mining. We, we both, you touched on it, and we talked about it a little bit beforehand. Because of the bear market for, certainly for mining equities and the, and the, and the, and the lack of any you know, money flowing to the, the research departments in, broker, in the brokerage sector, um, it seems to me that the analysts really stopped. Doing, all, all you got to do is get on a conference call and hear the questions and realize a lot of the analysts aren't really doing much homework at all. And so they boil down this simplistic notion of net asset value and then everything. And then they, and then they wave their magic wand. Well, this one's going to trade it one times NAV and that one should trade it three times. And which is a way for them to put some spin on the fact that all NAVs aren't created equal. I like to give people because people say, well, what do you mean? And I, I say, well, look, if you have an open pit mine, it's really got no ability to drill around it. The ore that's there is the ore that's there. And let's say, you know, your costs. You can pick your di discount rate, pick your gold rate, and you can come up with an NAV of what that might show you and you can run different prices. On the other hand, if you do the same thing to a, a mine that's underground where you're going to be stepping out all the time and you, you don't, and, and maybe you, it's been a bad cycle and you're not really exploring, you don't know what you've got to you keep building the mine plan out. And I like to give the example of when I first got involved with Pan America, we had this old, you know, not particularly – profitable silver mine called Kiravilka, which, you know, which if you looked at our books, it had an eight-year mine life. But I mean, it been in, it's been in production for 120 years. So if you just boiled it down to a nav of what you have, it wouldn't show much. Um, and this uh, open pit mine with an eight-year life would look better, when in reality, one had far more to give than the other. W would you comment a little bit on how this reliance on nav came about? And, 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 and on a positive note, I'm starting to see finally research reports where they're running the math of, well, if this price stays here, of course, all the analysts are so afraid of their shadow. You know, they might have a $2,000 gold price this year, but in, don't worry, in 15 months, it'll be back to 1400 or some other low number. So, so then th that distorts the NAVs, obviously, as well. Um, but I've started to see some change uh, in them actually doing some homework. But could I get you to opine on that topic? Yeah, I won't make any friends um, <laughs> with this comment. One of the things that I have seen is that to uh, research departments and investment banks uh, have uh, increasingly become cheerleaders for the investment bankers. Um, there is too little um, really, truly fundamental research going on. There's some very bright people in those organizations, by the way, but they're expected to earn their keep. And the way they earn their keep is by justifying decisions that were made by investment bankers, rationalizing decisions made by investment bankers, in, in many cases, rather than by uh, critical analysis. And I, and I think what you say is very true. I, I think that NAV is an important component. It's what you have. Uh, and and well, I think- it's what, you, it's what you know you have. You, yeah. It, it doesn't think, take into account what you don't know that you might have that you have to go spend money to find out about. I think it's the foundation uh, of further research. In other words, if you have a company that has a $5 billion market cap and has an $800 million net present value, it's going to be very difficult to find that extra 4.2, uh, almost no matter what you do. Excellent. So I think it's a wonderful place to start your search ellipsoid, uh, assuming that you're talking about more mature producing companies. But what you say is also extremely true, is the deposit Permissive, that is to say, is there the opportunity 
to expand the reserve through mineralized material. Is there a, a lot of rock that's classified as resource as a consequence of commodity price forecasts that you don't agree with? In other words, is there some embedded optionality for free? Importantly, in the sub billion or even sub two billion dollar market uh, space, uh, is there a management team that has the ability to lower their cost of capital as a consequence of reputation and also has the ability to squeeze extra juice out of the lemon? One of the things that happened to you guys at Kira Vilka is that the people who had owned it before you, uh, let's just say they didn't visit it as often as they might have. Um, and they used it as a cash cow. What happened predictably is that it was very important for you. You had a very high quality young team, a team that was willing to leave Vancouver and go to Peru. Um, <laughs> uh, and so you showed the deposit, love, care, attention, and thought. And the consequence of that is that the deposit uh, returned the compliments to you. It doesn't happen every time, but the right. truth is if you don't do the right thing, you'll never get the right result except by accident. So anyway, um, uh, I, one of the things that I think will be a byproduct uh, of, of the fact that um, Buffett's organization, regardless of who did it, looked at the, you know, looked at Barrick and saw some of the attractiveness of the, the entity, you know, as a business, I think it's going to bring many more people in to start kicking the tires. And it's a particularly great time because I think the industry in general is so much better set up than it was, say, in the last cycle. In the last cycle, because of after 08, everyone printed money, including the Chinese, the price of all commodities went up. So costs of miners went up as fast as gold. That hurt them. And then a lot of managers made the mistake of, of, of bringing on marginal stuff and the price would keep going down. Now they've been burnt for that. Both they were burnt last time. So this time they're being more careful on the, you know, what's we're going to do next. And um, and and they don't have the same rising cost pressures. So they're set up in a, in, in a really good position. And I think as 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 more people look at the sector and you get more headlines be, because of Buffett um, and, and others, there's been a lot of smart people that have advocated gold, I think. We're going to get a lot of eyes trained on on the industry, and, and they're going to find out there's a lot of these companies. If you took away the name of the company, the fact you're supposed to hate gold miners, there, as from a financial perspective, there are a lot of really compelling ideas out there. Um, that's in the that's in the guys that are producing already. I, obviously, the the, the explore codes and those are different. So I think that'll be uh, that'll 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 help get a better pricing structure and force the analysts to do more work and. As I say, I've already seen a little bit of that, and I'm, I'm kind of encouraged about it. Well, Bill, you said several important things there that should be unpacked individually. The first is that bad times encourage good habits. The 2000 to 2011 time frame um, was a real hothouse environment, and it encouraged all kinds of stupid activities. Deposits that shouldn't have been built got built. Companies that shouldn't have been bought got bought. Uh, and the stupid behavior was encouraged. Many of the management teams who engaged in that dis, uh, activity were allowed to pursue other employment opportunities in the <laughs> early part of the last decade. And the consequence is that the industry is much more efficient coming into good times than they were last time. And my suspicion is that those good habits will endure for, I don't know, 24, 36 months, some period of time. Yeah. Certainly stupidity will return when it's allowed. For but sure. right now, it's here. The second thing that you said that I think needs to be elaborated on is that there isn't much pressure on costs in the mining business as a consequence of the deterioration of currencies relative to the US dollar. As an example, a declining Canadian or Australian dollar means that the company's inputs uh, are, are at least flatlined because they're denominated in currencies that are weaker than the currency that they sell their product in. And also the incredible reduction in oil prices Mm -hmm. has uh, delivered a major, major, major benefit to an industry and its major energy users. So you have this weird circumstance where your biggest cost, which is the cost of capital, is artificially low. Uh, your energy costs, which are important, are low. And your other input costs, to the extent that you produce outside of the United States, 
uh, are denominated in currencies which are becoming weaker, uh, which is really good for margin. And the industry as a whole, or at least investors surrounding the industry, haven't really made the leap from looking at resource bases that were uneconomic at $1,200 and trying to figure out whether that rock is economic at $2,000. So there's the potential without an awful lot of capital expenditure to really increase that uh, all important NAV number you were talking about simply by increasing the drill density in materials where you wouldn't have drilled to convert them to reserves because the, con the consequence of minerals pricing was that you couldn't, irrespective of the data that you had, classify them as reserves. And I don't think people outside the industry have understood the potential value steps that I think that you described in the conversation we just had. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, said differently, um, as people actually spend some time and do some actual research right. on these companies, if you go through them on a case-by-case -case basis, you're liable to find a lot of things that you hadn't counted on. I'll, I'll give an example because maybe readers would like to have, or viewers would like to have some examples. I'll, um, um, and you know, full disclosure, I own Pan American Silver, but what happened was sort of interesting in that you know, Pan American has its assets that, that, that produce, but, um, you know, a couple of years ago when gold was back down in the 1100s, you know, they made an, an agreement to take over Tahoe Resources. Right. Um, and, and after the merger, the stock just languished for, I don't know, maybe it was, I can't remember now, maybe a year and a half anyway. It's like, meanwhile, at, this, at the same time, they now had so that with that they and they paid for it. They had the the potential for Escobar, which is in Guatemala, and we'll see what happens there with the with the court and stuff. But they picked up some gold assets that were uh, they basically bought them at about half of today's price. I mean, it's eleven hundred and change. And it turns out when the Pan American management got there, they were able to do some things with those gold assets that the Tahoe management hadn't. But for the longest time, the stock list just languished and. In addition to having the new mines, the the, the the potential for Escobar, the potential for Navidad in Argentina, if it ever happens, um, they, they had this wonderful find under La Colorado, this scarn that at the time, I mean, potentially could be worth a billion dollars. I think the combined market cap of the whole mess after the Tahoe deal was like sat there for at three, three and a half billion forever. And then, you know, then things got in gear. But that's just an example of anyone had spent any time kicking the tires and you could probably give. 15 other examples just like that. But I think the the, the the moral of the story to people is that right now you can't rely on the quote unquote analysts. You've really got to get in and do the work and you've got to find somebody that you know or trust that actually knows something about mining to under to uncover those things that you mentioned that are that are there in the company that you're not going to see at first blush if you don't dig in. You know, if you think about it, the analysts have an incentive to cover companies that are capital consumers, not capital right. generators because the money is made in financings. And so a company that's self-financing, which won't come to market, uh, offers no incentive to an, to an investment bank to cover. It's perverse. But yeah. the companies that are capital consumers rather than capital generators get the most coverage. And the analysts have to figure out uh, a way to convince investors that dilution is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that's a real challenge. Now, my suspicion is that we're in the sort of a, the fourth inning of the precious metals mergers and acquisition game. And one thing that will force the analysts to do a little bit of work is to look for a hidden value in merger and acquisitions uh, uh, as this market matures. What's happened in prior markets, in my experience, has been that the multi-asset companies, the, the large multi-asset companies with better trading liquidity, begin to trade at such premium valuations relative to, as an example, single asset companies, uh, that uh, two things happen. Investors like you and I move down the quality trail looking for valuation disparities. And as we said earlier, if we don't, Barrick and Newmont do right. <laughs> come down and use their lower cost of capital. And I think as, we, as, the, as, the, as the cycle matures, uh, that some of the research will improve simply because the merger and acquisition fees from the investment bank's point of view replace the financing fees. I'm not saying that they would do it for the reason that they ought to do it, which is to make their clients money, right. heaven forbid. Uh, 
but rather because of the nature of the incentives. So if a person doesn't have the, doesn't feel like they have the ability to look at, you know, an Explorer Co or a smaller producer that, you know, may have some serious potential is just looking at, at, at bigger companies. Do you have a, a small list of the bigger companies that you think are well enough positioned? I mean, perhaps we could share a couple of names. I don't know. If we're, are we supposed to do that or is that I'm, like verboten? I'm a licensed person, so I'm not you allowed can't. to do that. That's investment advice. Ah, okay. Uh, I would tell you that in a general sense, my suspicion is that the two or three very large royalty and streaming companies are probably superior businesses. They're priced at a premium, but I suspect that a company with an 80% profit margin deserves to be priced at a premium relative to a company with a 15 or 16% profit margin. I'll leave it there. I, I would also say for most generalists, Bill, and I think you would agree with this from the investors that you've talked to, that uh, for people who don't have the expertise and don't have the time, Simply capturing de-risked beta, in other words, even being willing to underperform the gold market, the gold indexes as a whole, by owning the largest and most liquid companies, by minimizing the mistakes, is not a bad strategy. If in the eight prior recoveries from oversold bottoms, the index response has been between 150% and 1100%, let's say that you underperformed that by 15%, but you de-risked it. Right. In my declining years, settling for, say, 130 as opposed to 150 or 900 as opposed to 1100 by de-risking that sleeping nights and staying calm is not a horrific outcome. <laughs> right. So said differently, financial strength, um, a stronger balance sheet, a sort of proven management, uh, those kind of things will carry you along. We own bigger companies. You'll capture the you won't be a hero. But yeah. you won't be a goat either. I think that's one of the uh, best pieces of advice that anyone who's been around the industry for very long will say is never buy just one mining company. Now, obviously, the bigger it is, the more they've taken that they've geographically diversified and have different mine types. But I think that that's a that's a pretty good way to have a shopping list. What you just said, um, and and folks won't do so badly if they just do that. Oh, I think that's right. Well, I certainly enjoyed this. I, I hope that the folks at Real Vision uh, have us back on, or failing that, that you and I uh, just get together now that we're neighbors. Yeah, let's. well, let's plan on doing it once the travel restrictions come off a little bit. Come down to town, I'll buy you dinner and pour you some wine. We will do that. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com, where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.